I told y'all earlier that vocab was going around, walking up on every Hebrew he could find, taking it to him, banging and going in. But it's one Hebrew he have never crossed yet. And that's the man that y'all see on the screen. Zion, the lion, roaring king, Zion Lex. So vocab is going to have a different conversation with Zion Lex because he's not the average Israelite, bro. I'm trying to show you that. And so the topic of today's discussion, debate, will be Zion Lex versus Vocab Malone. Who are the biblical Israelites of today? That right there is the title. That is the question. And we want to see what's going on with that. You got two minutes in this round for your opening statement. Are you ready, brother? I want to start off with a few important considerations. This is kind of food for thought. As we ask this question about who the biblical Israelites are. Firstly, what, according to Scripture, did Christ say he would build? Everyone think about that. If you, if you know your Bibles, even if you don't hold the New Testament as authoritative, think about a New Testament answer to this. What did Christ say he would build? Was it the nation of Israel? The answer is the church. Greek, the Ecclesia. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is something that doesn't seem to be in existence. Otherwise, why would he be building it? Yet this is what he's saying he's going to do, and it centers on the ministry and mission of the apostles and the disciples. The contextual background is important. Matthew 16, 16 and 17. You have Simon Peter replying, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my father who is in heaven. Notice the emphasis there. How did he come by way of that information? Secondly, within what community is conflict now resolved? Is it the nation of Israel? Answer, the church, the ecclesia. And so notice this is after the passage we just read, because this is in Matthew 18, so that's important to understand. This has to do with church discipline and how the community self-regulates in regards to standards. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. The church is what Christ came to build. He is building something new. The church is the new covenant people of God. That's why conflict is resolved within that body. So when we ask who are the biblical Israelites of today, my thesis is through Messiah, the church is true Israel now and for all eternity. All right. That's vocabs opening right there. Let's head on over to my brother Zion Lex. Your screen is up. All right. Perfect. So I want to say from the outset, uh, vocab uh, is, is not having a good day. Um, the title of tonight's debate is Who Are the Biblical Israelites Today? Um, anyone that looks at the title already knows that this is a historical conversation. Now, I am a biblical person myself. Um, I'm the head of an, uh, an academy. Uh, I've been teaching for many, many years. When we're having conversations about the Bible and what the Bible has to say exclusively, there's always a time, place, and a space for that. But tonight's debate is who are the biblical Israelites today? So that means the bulk of the debate is historical information, right? It's, 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 it's an easy thing uh, to think in one's mind that one is going to go into the Bible, pull out Bible verses to prove who a historical people are. It's another thing altogether when you enter a historical setting to talk about who are the biblical Israelites today. So I want to say that from the outset, uh, my brother, vocab, is not having a good day, um, and I yield my time. That's all I have to say. Round one, vocab. You got 15 minutes in this round. Time will start when you're ready. Already, notice I stated a positive claim and try to explain what I'm going to try to do. Zion just criticized, didn't offer anything, and made a mistake already. He said, right. this Are is you ready? Time yes. is yeah. He said, this is a historical consideration. And yet the title literally says, who are the biblical Israelites of today? So it's a current consideration and it's biblical. He said, you can't just pull out Bible passage to say, who are the Israelites? Well, it's literally in the title. It says biblical 
Israelites of today. So I'm not sure what title he's reading, but we're not. It doesn't say who are the historical Israelites outside of the Bible or something. Somebody's mic's not muted. I'm getting sniffles, sniffles and stuff like that. If you, if you could mute that, please. So the thesis statement is thoroughly scriptural, and it's important because it's biblical. That's the very title we've got going on here. I'm going to show four supporting lines of biblical evidence for this question, the biblical Israelites of the day. And there's really no other way to answer this than what I'm going to answer this. What I mean is, this is something that Scripture clearly teaches that you really can't deviate from and be faithful to Scripture. The faithful and true Church of Christ is the eschatological. That means for today, for this time, which is the end time since Christ has come, these latter days, as the Scripture itself declares. Therefore, Christians are eschatological Israelites. What does this mean? It means the Church embodies the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham. This means that Christians are the eschatological, biblical Israelites of today. Here's what it does not mean. That does not mean the church is literally or ethnically Israeli, Israel. This does not preclude a mass conversion of ethnic Israelites in the future. This does not mean that ethnic Israel's failure is total, final, or permanent. This does not mean there isn't a remnant of believing Israel in the present. So that's what it doesn't mean mean. But it is true that the church is the true Israel of God. That's Galatians 6, 16. Made up of true children of Abraham. That's Galatians 3. Who are the true Jews? That's Romans chapter 9. It is the true holy nation. That's First Peter. Next verse as well. A kingdom of priests who offer spiritual sacrifices. That's Romans 12 and Romans 15. After having been redeemed from Egypt by the death of, the, of, of Christ, their Passover, that's St. Corinthians. The church is not a physical nation, but a spiritual one. Christ says, I didn't come to build that in John 18 before Pilate. The very body of Christ of which each individual Christian is a member. And some of those quotes, I'm paraphrasing the law of Christ by Charles Letter. First biblical line of evidence, we really got to start in the beginning. God called Abraham to bless all the families of the earth. We need to understand the point of the call of Abraham. Why did God call Abraham? Genesis 12, 3, to bless all the families of the earth. This is fundamental to the biblical story. Here's what Yahweh says. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's two alternative ways to translate it if you would like. The idea is the same. The families of the earth descend from who, ladies and gentlemen? From Adam. What was Adam's God-given mission? So now we're going back to the first covenant in the garden. What jobs did Adam have to do? Be fruitful and multiply. Rule and subdue. Cultivate and keep. Live in community. Live in fellowship with God. But he failed. He was supposed to do those things, but sin equals expulsion, equals the mission hindered, equals the curse upon all of Adam's descendants. And that is why when you get to the New Testament, the question is not, are you in Jacob or in Esau or some under, other type of arrangement? It's, are you in Adam? Are you in Christ? That is the fundamental Fundamental question every person must ask themselves, because Adam, our federal head, failed in his mission. What will Yahweh do? What he always planned. Call out a new people from Adam's offspring. This is where the picture of Abraham comes into play. And yes, I understand there's a name change. I'm be using the name Abraham throughout. To bless all the families of the earth, the way in which God would ultimately do this is by the chosen seed, which was prophesied in Genesis 3, who is the Messiah, the Christ. This is literally, precisely the argument of Galatians 3, 7 through 9, 16 and 22. Know then, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. That's very important. We can't let this slide. How does the Bible define who were the sons of Abraham? If you're of his same trust in Yahweh's promises. Continuing, in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, which is the same way Abraham was justified, because he was justified prior to his circumcision. Continuing, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, now look, 
quoting Genesis 12, 3 here, and you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. This is fundamental. This is the biblical way to define it. I don't know why other people want to define it other ways. Why would we define the sons of Abraham differently than God defines it? I'm not sure. The promise of Genesis 12, 3. This is from uh, Expositor's Bible Commentary, which, like the declaration of Abraham's righteousness by faith, chronologically precedes the institution of circumcision, included the Gentiles with the Jews in the covenant of blessing Abraham, the neither Jew nor Gentile proto-believer. That is a good description of who he is, because think about what he's called out of, who he's called out of, right? He's just a regular old guy like everybody else. There are no descendants of Abraham at this point. Thus becomes for Paul, the father of all who believe, whether Jew or Gentile. So Paul adds that all who believe as Abraham did are blessed through justification as a result of their faith. Continuing with Galatians 3, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Notice the emphasis here. It's on the Messiah. Messiah changes everything because he brings in a new covenant. Continuing, the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So who inherits the promises given to Abraham? Those who believe. It's not based upon blood. It's based upon belief. And that's why Matthew 28, at the end of the gospel, Jesus tells his disciples to go into all the nations and commands them to do what he told them to do. He is, in a meaningful way, a new Moses. And indeed, that's what was predicted in Deuteronomy 18. So a second line of evidence is that being counted as true Israel was never strictly or merely based on biology. Let's take a look at this. You see a narrowing focus within the divine promise. The Abrahamic promise was not all-inclusive. God did not include every person descended from Abraham, did not include Ishmael, did not include Esau. And indeed, Paul emphasizes God's choice in Romans 9 in this very manner. God gets to decide who is Israel. So birth to the, quote, right family is not enough. This election is according to God's will, God's grace. It's not DNA or biology or blood. That's not the defining factor. Let me give you some evidence from Scripture. John 1, 11 through 13, focusing in on verse 12. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Notice, Paul and John are not at odds here. This is the New Testament witness, and indeed, faithful to the old as well. Verse 13, who were born not of blood. So why are we going to be focusing on blood? I know I'm not, because why? The scripture's not. So why would we go against the scripture's emphasis? I'm not going to do that tonight. Nor the will of the flesh. I mean, do we need any more? I guess we do, because the next line, nor of the will of man, now we have the source, but of God. This is why John the Baptist told Jewish people who came to him and thought they were going to be okay, do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. It is not enough. It's never been enough. And the next line speaks of their coming judgment. The same thing happens in John 3. When Nicodemus wants to know how to attain the kingdom of God, why does Jesus not say, keep the law, statutes, and commandments? Why doesn't he say, retain your identity? Why doesn't he say something like that? He tells him he needs to be born again. It's almost as if the natural birth that Nicodemus currently possesses as a faithful Jew in the first century is not enough. Nicodemus does not understand this because there's an element of hiddenness in the Old Testament. But when you read Ezekiel, you'll see, oh, that's where this comes from. That's why you've got to be born of the Spirit. Look at verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is the flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Jesus is plainly telling us what we need to enter into the kingdom, and it's not ethnicity. So if Zion was Ashkenazi making whatever arguments he's going to make tonight, my arguments would literally be the same because I'm sticking to the biblical text regardless of what the other person is saying. Now, we'll deal with his emphasis when it comes to it, but look at John continuing on with this, with the words of Jesus in John chapter 8. Five minutes. Uh, that you are offspring of Abraham. 
So he knows they're actually Jewish, and yet he's and yet watch what he's going to say to them. He's talking about their father. They're like, "Well, Abraham's our father." He said, "No, no, no, you're of your father, the devil." Yet they're they're Jews. How is that possible? Because bloodline is not enough. Scripture affirms that within the larger body of Israel, there is true Israel. Look at Romans nine six. You have of Israel, that's the flesh, versus true Israel. You have Abraham's seed, 9-7, versus Abraham's children or seed, which are true, according to Romans 9-7, reading this in the full context of Romans and, of course, Paul's other writings and the New Testament itself. You have children of the flesh versus children of the promise. The contrast is clear and plain, but let's give a few more examples Esther 8.17, this shows that people who are not even Jews can join in the people of God. Now, the, I have a lot on this. Because of time, I'm going to have to skip some of this and go to the next biblical point. Because I think it's been shown that being counted as true Israel was never strictly based on biology, but rather trusting in Yahweh's word. And yes, true faith is followed by obedience. Can't leave that out. Next biblical line of evidence is that Messiah is the ultimate fulfillment of promises made to Abraham. So when you look and see this, and I'm going to have to skip some things, maybe you'll be able to revisit it. But in essence, we understand that Christ is the true Israel, the ultimate promised seed, reiterating Galatians 3.16. Notice how everything points to Christ when you read through the scripture. And I'm going to show you one example, I wish we could do more, where the biblical writers understood this. Matthew 2, 14 and 15. He rose and took the child, that's Jesus, and his mother tonight and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I have called my son. First of all, it's interesting they were leaving Israel, and yet he gives the proclamation that it's out of Egypt, and yet they don't actually leave Egypt until a number of verses later. But notice, well, who was this originally about? Go to Hosea. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. This was a looking back by the prophet Hosea upon the nation of Israel, speaking of Israel as a son in this very manner. And yet that gets applied to Jesus. If you don't understand typology, you won't understand how that's a prophecy with a fulfillment. If you do and understand the Christocentric focus of the New Testament, you will clearly see from this and other examples that you should be familiar with that Jesus is the faithful and perfect Israel, God's son. The Bible, therefore, is a story of God's work in history to sum up all things in Christ. I have a little part in covenants. I'm not going to be able to get to some of that, but I do want to read this from Ephesians 1. So you can see, this ain't crazy talk. This is Bible talk. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment. And that's what the birth of Christ. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of both the promises to Abraham's family and the typological patterns as seen in the history of Israel. The Messiah is the ultimate fulfillment of promises to Abraham. The fourth biblical line of evidence is that the believer in Messiah now shares in the Abrahamic promises. Therefore, the followers of Christ are the true Israelites. We shouldn't be calling people who are not faithful to God, faithful to God, unless they are faithful to God. And how does God define it? You have to have the trust of Abraham. So if you don't believe in Messiah, you're not a true Israelite. No matter who your father and grandfather going back thousands of years is, is it just doesn't matter, biblically speaking. Now, continuing on here, I want to show something from Galatians 6 that gives evidence to what I just said there. Far be it, Paul says, from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, notice that, nor uncircumcision, so what does count? But a new creation, same thing Jesus told Nicodemus. And as for all who walk by this rule, the rule just stated, peace and mercy be upon them uh, and upon the Israel of God. The Israel of God. This is how Paul is referring to Christians in the New Testament. And that type of thing happens all throughout the New Testament. For example, the church is seen as the bride of Christ. Think about it. Who is Jesus said to be married to, ladies and gentlemen? Ephesians 5. 
in all the scriptures on the screen, when you put them all together, even Old Testament pre-shadowing, the lamb's wife is the church, the bride of Christ. Jesus doesn't have two brides. He doesn't have another one. All and right. Tom, Tom. Tom. Tom, brother. All right. Let's go, Zion. Remove your screen. Okay, so Zion, load up, load up the guns, brother. Let's get it. Let's go. Load up the ammunition. You got 15 minutes in this round. The title is Who Are the Biblical Israelites Today? All right, time will start. Talk, start talking. All right, I want to say from the outset, vocab showed up to the wrong debate. Uh, it appears as if that he acknowledges that his premise has failed from the very beginning because he's declining to address the issue, the topic. The topic essentially is who are the biblical Israelites today, right? The topic is not who are the biblical Israelites today from a Christological lens. The topic is not who are the biblical Israelites today from the view of the Bible alone. The topic is who are the biblical Israelites today? We're talking about history. And so he should have began with history, but I'll, I'll pick up where he should have began and I'll go into my screen share. I'm not sure how long vocab has been around doing this, but I've been around for quite some time. Uh, if you look at the paper clip, uh, it's from 1998. I'm already four years in the Israelite community by this time. This paper goes back to 26 years ago. I've been dealing with this topic of who are the biblical Israelites in history for a very, very long time. So much so that 26 years ago, uh, our local newspaper, the Third Eye News, printed in Brooklyn, New York, 297 Saratoga Avenue for Congregation Shema Israel. Um, I authored this article going into the history of European Jews. When we talk about the biblical Israelites, at times questions arise as to what they look like. Um, here's a primary image from uh, the tomb of Kanum Hometep II, not necessarily showing Israelites but showing the look of Semites in ancient Egypt, because these are people known as the Hyksos, the Hekhasut. And so we know what the Semites look like in the 15th century BCE, and they certainly didn't look like Vocab Malone, and they certainly didn't look like the people who are building uh, secret tunnels here in New York City. I'll move on. We have historical texts inside of Jewish lore there's a text known as Perke Rabbi De Eliezer, which speaks to the color of the original biblical Israelites. And it speaks of their ancestors. It speaks of Shem, Ham, and Yapheth. And I want to read something really quick. It says in Hebrew, Barak le Shem, Levana, Shakurim, Weni'im, Weha Nachalim, Et Chol Eretz, Noshvet, Baruch Lehem, Wevana, Shakurim, he blessed Shem, black and desirable in Hebrew, Shakorim, Shakor being the root. Shem is called black. By Midrashic and Jewish sources, they acknowledge biblical Shem to be black. I have this on the screen because we should begin by acknowledging to some extent what was the look, maybe even the phenotype of the biblical Israelites? As far as we're told in modern history, the history of the Jews in Europe spans a period of over 2,000 years. Jews is an, are, are considered an Israelite tribe from Judea in the Levant, and they began migrating to Europe just before the rise of the Roman Empire in 27 before the Common Era. Although Alexandrian Jews had already migrated to Rome, a notable early event in the history of the Jews in the Roman Empire was the 63 BCE siege of Jerusalem. And so the idea presented by most is that the reason why we find European Jewry today is after 70 AD, the majority of Jews fled into Europe. And we're going to challenge much of those claims today, and we're going to address what's right from what's wrong. This is a map if everyone can really just blow up your screen for a moment, even if you need to take away the, com the uh, comment section, because I want to make sure that everyone is able to follow this. This is a map of what's called the early Jewish diaspora until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. If you focus on the map, you can quite literally see 
that Jews have been entering heartland Africa since the 5th century BCE, attested to by historians. Right here where my arrow is hovering, it says, according to Philo of Alexandria, in the 1st century AD, Jews in Egypt numbered 1 million. That's Africa, right? 12% of the total population, including 200,000 in Alexandria, Egypt alone. So what this map shows us is how long Jews have been in heartland Africa and to what extent they travel towards Europe. If you focus very clearly on the map, the only parts of Europe acknowledged that Jews travel to are parts of Rome, otherwise known as Italy, parts of Greece, the port parts mentioned in the New Testament, and of course, as we already know, parts of Asia Minor and Mesopotamia. But there are no attestations from the first, second centuries BCE, third BCE, fourth BCE, none BCE of any Israelite or even what scholars call Jewish settlements in uh, Europe, as it were. You only begin to see settlements around the second century BCE, and that occurs with Greece, followed by Rome. Thank you. In this other map, you can actually see the routes a little bit more clearly. So what historians acknowledge is that Israelites have a pattern of exile and a pattern of escape. When Israelites needed to escape persecution, when Israelites needed to avoid famine, they have a history of going into Africa, namely Egypt. You don't see Israelites traveling to parts of Europe, any part of Europe for a famine. You don't see Israelites in historical biblical times traveling into Europe. The only times you begin to see that, again, is with the onset of the Greek kingdom. But as you can see, there are major Israelite settlements all, all throughout Africa long before we begin to see what's considered today European Jewry. This map, I wanted to hold towards the end, but vocab kind of made it a little easy, so I'll show it now. Um, this map shows the migration pattern of Jews leaving Spain and Portugal from what's called the Alhambra Decree. In 1492, Spain issues that which is known as the uh, Alhambra Decree. The Alhambra Decree is the forced expulsion of Jews out of Spain. It was followed five years later by the forced expulsion of Jews out of Portugal. If you literally trace the arrows, you literally see Jews leaving Spain and Portugal and coming into Africa in 1492. In 1497, you see a small pocket of Jews leaving Portugal and going to Holland. But the primary route, the main route that Jews are keeping in fleeing Spain and Portugal is to go into continental Africa, something they've had a history of doing even since biblical days. Joseph coming down into Egypt, Abraham going into Egypt, Jacob going into Egypt. I'll continue. There are a number of historical scholars that speak towards these things. I'm going to bring us back to this part at the very end because I want to acknowledge something really quick. The earliest settlement of Jews in Germany, or what's called the Rhineland, occurs in about 321 CE. That's the earliest settlement of Jews in a region that will later be considered the foundational hallmark of where Ashkenazic Jewry begins. The city is called Cologne and it is known historically as Cologne on the Rhine. The history of the Jews in Cologne dates to 321 CE when it was recorded in a census decreed by the Emperor Constantine. As such, it is the oldest European Jewish community north of the Alps. The community quickly established itself in what came to be known as Cologne's Jewish quarters, building its very first synagogue in 1000 or 1040 Common Era. Just so we're clear, Israelites are building synagogues in Africa literally 1500 years before that, because you have a temple built in Elephantine in Egypt by Israelites, where they're reported and documented as celebrating Passover. So long before you see synagogues are appearing in uh, Europe, you already have not only synagogues in heartland continental Africa, but you even have a temple. It's known as the Elephantine Temple. 
in a work known as Kitab al Buldan. By the way, when we're talking about history and we're placing a people in a historical context, you usually want to come with sources that are dealing in history. So I'm a person that follows the Bible, but I'm intelligent enough to know when to introduce the Bible and when to look at history, because at times the two can be misconstrued. According to Arab geographer Abu Abbas al Yaqubi, he wrote about a kingdom of converted Jews called the Khazars between the Black and Caspian Seas. This is page 121. The book is known as Kitab al Budan. I'll continue. In a work known as the Kuzari, by the way, the text I'm going to be quoting from, I have here in my library uh, on hand, ready to show. A text known as the Kuzari, also known as the Khazar Correspondence, is a historical account detailing the conversion of European Jews, who later come to be known as Ashkenazic Jews. I think it's extremely important to point out at this point that this work was produced by a Jew. His name is Rabbi, not just a Jew, a rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. The name of the work is the Kuzari, which is how you say Khazar in Hebrew. And the work deals with detailing the account of how the Europeans came into conversion <laughs> as Jews. Another work that is a little bit more popularly known is Arthur Kostler's 13th Tribe which documents the history of the Khazars in European Jewry through research and study, it may just be the biggest hoax played out in modern history yet. This is actually from the foreword in the book. The foreword in the book says, the history of the Khazars and European Jewry through research and study may just be the biggest hoax played out in modern history yet. By the way, Arthur Kostler is himself a European Ashkenazic Jew. Shalom Osan, current Israeli Tel Aviv University professor, as in current professor teaching at Israeli University, Tel Aviv University. He says in his book, The Invention of the Jewish People, Israeli historian and Tel Aviv University professor Shalom Osan argues in his book that most modern Jews descended from converts. I'll continue. In Codex Judaica, I'm not sure who vocab is used to having discussions with, but uh, I'm used to having real sources. In Codex Judaica, a book that I'm actually holding in my hand, but Sonata doesn't have my screen showed up so you can't see. But in Codex Judaica, European Jews acknowledge the Khazar conversion. They even acknowledge the year. It says in Codex Judaica on page 167, the Khazars, a people said to originate from the vicinity of Turkey, lived at this time in a region between the Black and Caspian Sea. Their king and many of his people converted to Judaism. In that same book on page 175, the author of the Kuzari, whose name is Kisdai ibn Shabrut, he's the one in the Kuzari that's writing letters of dialogue between a Khazar king. It says, Kasdai ibn Sharut, who some say sent letters to Joseph, the Jewish king of the Khazars, 740 AD. Why am I pointing this out? A lot of times when we're having this conversation about who the Jews are, a lot of people like to begin where it makes sense by talking about who the Jews are not, because a lot of people have an already formed opinion about who these Jews are. So we have to challenge that. And so that's what I'm doing. Codex Judaica, which is the chronological index of Jewish history, acknowledges the Khazar conversion. It even acknowledges the date 740. What this work really speaks of, and this is extremely important, in this exchange in the Kuzari, <clears throat> Rabbi Yehuda Halevi documents that when Ibn Sharut talks to Eastern European Jews, he is surprised because he had never heard of there being any Jews beyond Italy, Greece, and Spain and Portugal, Africa, Israel, and Babylon. No one had ever heard of European Jews at that time. By the, year, by the way, it's the 10th century, the 900s.
In Tommy 32a, in the oral tradition, it says, when Alexander was preparing to uh, part from the elders of the Negev, he said to them, I want to go out to wage war against the country of Africa, called in Hebrew, Afriki. Now, I only have this on the screen to show you that the term Afriki in Jewish literature denotes Africa. But the next screen is what I really want to show you. In the Babylonian Talmud, in Sanhedrin 94a, Marzutra, a Babylonian Talmudic scholar, says, to where did Sennacherib exile the 10 tribes? Marzutra said, Afriki, Africa. That's in Jewish literature. In a work entitled Hebrewisms of West Africa, it says on page 169, in 70 AD, large numbers of Jews fled or drifted into Ethiopia, otherwise known as Africa at the time, Abyssinia and neighboring territories. In a work known as North Africa, produced by the United States Defense Department, Department of Defense, what a lot of people don't know is that the United States Department of Defense actually has historical works. Being that I'm a museum tour guide and I, I'm always in the museums, when you go in the bookshops of the museums, you see many works produced by the United States Department of Defense that are just dealing exclusively with history. So in the United States Department of Fence, Defense, they have a book on North Africa. And look at what it says on page 17. The Jews began fil filtering into the Mediterranean coastal cities before the Roman conquest of North Africa. After Roman Emperor Titus captured Jerusalem in 70 AD, many more fled into North Africa. Africa. So there's this myth that 90% of the Jews went into Europe when all of the historical sources are saying the majority of the Jews fled into Africa. So why is it today that Ashkenazic Jews who are considered 95% of world Jewry, how is it possible when they originate from a region where there's converts? That's your time there. We're going into the second round, which you have 10 minutes, powerful response, powerful opening by vocab, Powerful response by Zion the Lion. I just learned something just now, man. When he talked about Afrique, Afrique in Hebrew means Afrique or something like that, because we've been saying that for a long time in Africa. So what I'm going to do is we got Zion up next. I mean, um, vocab up next with 10 minutes. Begin when you're ready. Thank you. Your slides is up. Let me know when you're ready. All right. Zion says he wants some sources outside of the Bible, even though Bible is literally in today's title, and I'll gladly supply him with that. I have Are it. you ready? Yes, I am. I Time got it prepared up. already. He showed this image. Now, I'm going to show the actual inscription. This is usually how it's uh, sort of colored in, but you'll see that it matches with what's underneath. You have the Semitic traders there, uh, labeled as Hyskos, and this is a mural on Tomb 3 at Beni Hassam. And it's important to notice that the Egyptians portray themselves as well as the Semites. Notice the color of the Egyptians versus the color of the Semites. They are not the same. Now, here's what it actually looks like. You can see the same reality. They're using two different pigmentations. Unless my eyes were deceiving me, when Zion Lex showed this image to you, he cut it off before it showed the Egyptian figure. He only showed the Semitic figures, so you had no way to compare and contrast. Why did he do that? That doesn't seem like an honest way to argue, but I have more archaeology for him. What did Nubians look like, according to Egyptians? Because we've seen Semites. Let's take a look. The source is on the screen. Like that. Did, did the Semites we just saw, did they, did they look like this? Look closely, ladies and gentlemen. Look very closely. These are Nubian slaves underneath the feet of Ramses II. They do not look like the Semites he showed out of context because he didn't show you anything else. But I've got some more. I'm not here today to go to bat for European Jews. But since Zionlex wants to talk about it, we can ask the question, was there a diaspora to Europe? I don't know who he's thinking of that says 90% 
of the folks who fled went into Europe? I, I don't know who says that. I've never said that. But since he's asking, <laughs> it's prophesied and predicted even in the Old Testament. You have in Joel 3, 4 through 8, a Greek slave trade mentioned. Sometimes you'll see the word Javan there, but here it's translated right there. You have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their own border. It already even started in the Old Testament. Like I said, my case is built upon who has the faith of Abraham. But if he wants to go this route, we can go this route and show he is simply incorrect. In fact, the, pro the prophecy of Daniel contains the kingdoms of Greece and Rome prophesied clearly. These are European kingdoms. And if you listen to Zion Lex, he believes that a good proof for why he is actually a descendant of Abraham is because he says, if you notice, the big empires always sweep up our people. And that's one way you know. Well, if that's the case, and, and, and then he says, that's where we go. If that's the case, well, then you're going to go into Greece and Rome. It's prophesied right there in Daniel. Europe is mentioned in the Bible. So I don't know who these people he's quoting to say they never heard of European Jews. What's he talking about? Had they never read the book of Romans, the book of Corinthians? Didn't they read about Paul and Malta? Didn't they read about Greece and Macedonia? Didn't they see Philippians? Didn't they read Thessaloniki? Didn't they see Paul in Athens with Jews there? Didn't they see Titus on Crete? Didn't they see the letters to the church at Galatia, which had Jews? Didn't they see Dalmatia, Ilcrium, Acts 2, 9, 11, which mentions people from all over, plus things in the Apocrypha? Didn't they even see in Isaiah 66 when you have a return, they're coming out of Javan to the coastlands far away. Well, that's Greece. So I am a little perplexed by some of what he said there. But let me share a couple of other things that I think will help answer some of the things that were just said to us. And I'm not against Zion. I hope that he continues his journey with the Messiah that he has started in the past five years. But that's something very important. Zion Lex showed us a newspaper image from 1998 and was proud that he had written this article at 26, 26 years ago. With all due respect, you've been studying this Bible that whole time. And for 25 years, you've been wrong about the most important prediction in the Old Testament, who the Messiah is. I don't think it makes sense to go around trumpeting when you were unaware, denying Jesus is the Messiah for two decades and a half and missing the main prophecy that's sitting right there in front of your face. Now, I don't want to go too hard on that because I want to encourage you to continue in your journey, but I don't think it's a point of bragging. I think it's something like Paul said in Philippians 3, it should be a point that you say, this is scubalon. I count those things as worthless because you were on the wrong track. You missed the big picture. You had a blindness. And I feel like if I was wrong about something that important for 25 years, I would step to the stage with just a little bit of humility when we, when we deal with these issues. Frankly, that's what I'm hoping for here tonight. He said something strange. He said, well, hey, uh, you know, this isn't a Christological lens. This isn't a Christological lens that we're talking about here. Not a Christological lens. Let me share my slide again here. I, I, I'm very confused why he would say that when we come to this issue. This certainly should be viewed through a Christological lens. Why do I say that? Because that's the way Jesus interpreted Scripture. Don't we want to interpret Scripture the way Jesus interpreted Scripture? I know that I do. Can I show you, ladies and gentlemen, the way Jesus and his Spirit-led disciples interpreted Scripture? And I would hope that if you are a true disciple of Jesus, you'll do the same thing. Jesus is the interpretive key. And look at this. He has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. The scripture says in Hebrews, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. The references on the screen, the greatest prophet of Judaism points to someone else. Jesus, the authoritative prophet. God has revealed himself over time and his revelation has come to a climax in Jesus Christ. Now all previous revelation must be understood in light of this centrality. That's from a book called What is New Covenant Theology? But let's show 
where the Bible says what I just said out of that book. This is Hebrews chapter one. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, why are these the last days if it's been 2000 years? Because the coming of Christ upon the scene marks the final stage in God's plan of redemption for his people, who, by the way, are reckoned by their faith, not by their bloodline. Now he has spoken, the scripture says, to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. We must read the Old Testament storyline like the Spirit-led apostles, like Jesus did. I'm going to show you a few more places where you can see how they interpret the Scripture in a way that's Christocentric. And Zion Lex should do the same thing. That was a weird thing to me that he said, not through a Christocentric lens. 1 Corinthians 2.2 2 says something different. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what Paul says. And yet Paul also said in Acts 20, 27, I did not shrink from declaring you the whole counsel of God. Now, how can you put those two things together unless the scripture speaks to Jesus? And indeed, Luke 24, 27 and 44 show Jesus beginning with Moses and all the prophets and the Psalms interpreting the things concerning himself. So if we're not interpreting scripture in a Christocentric way, guess what? We're not doing it like the Messiah, because that's not the only time Jesus showed that he is indeed the center, the crux, the epicenter of the Bible itself. John 5, 39 through 40. This goes to everyone who yet denies Christ. You search the scriptures because you think that in him you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Now, notice this. He makes acceptance of his claims the way to gain eternal life. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Why should we listen to Jesus though? Because this is who he is. In Acts 3, they speak back on what Moses said in Deuteronomy 18. And here's what's said. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. No exceptions. He is in charge. He is the boss. This is the way we should be interpreting scripture. Don't we see that? So a big part of this debate really is not about just some historical claim, which by the way, again, I emphasize to you, the title of the debate literally has biblical in it. It's also about biblical interpretation, but let's go to the history for a second here. He said, well, look, he showed a picture. He said, look, Shem is black. Well, so is Ham on that slide. So how do you know who's who? That's what I want to know, Zynex, because you showed two guys. And it wasn't a white dude and a black dude. Shim and him. Both. So tell me how to discern. Is it by DNA? How, how is it that you make the distinction? How you know thousands of years after those two men existed, who's who? I want to know this. If you waste time with genealogy, that's important. He says that a, 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 is that 15 or is that 10? That's 10. Okay. Time will start when he's ready. Let's put your PowerPoint up. Let's get it together. Awesome debate, brothers. Awesome debate between both of y'all. Awesome debate. The people are loving it. We got 957 people in the audience watching, and they are loving every minute of it. The comments is going crazy. Let's go. Let's go whenever you're ready, brother. Remember now, right after this round, y'all got 10 minutes um, to engage cross-examination with each other, one minute to answer each other. So this is going to be a fire round coming up. Zion, time will start when you're ready, brother. Let me unmute you. Unmute you. Unmute your mic, Zion. Okay, I'm ready. My, my screen is shared. Can I, can I begin? Okay, so I, I didn't know. I didn't think that vocab would lie. But I mean, everything is recorded. So I, I just want to revisit something really quick because um, apparently I have enough time to do so. <laughs> Vocab says that Zion doesn't acknowledge that um, Italy, uh, Thessalonia, Greece are parts of Europe. I literally said that to the extent that it's actually on my PowerPoint slide. But apparently he wasn't doing enough listening. And again, he showed up to the wrong uh, presentation. So I, I certainly said that beyond Greece, Beyond Italy or Rome and beyond the places mentioned in the New Testament, such as Thessalonia, Antioch, I'll even extend now, beyond those places, no part of Europe is ever mentioned. I certainly said that. Apparently, vocab has selective hearing, but I'll, I'll move on. 
Mm -hmm. Just get back to where I was. I'm going to pause your time. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. This is where I want to be. Time, time resume. Thank you, sir. So according to historian Josephus, 100,000 Jews fled from Israel into Africa in the third century BCE. This is from the Jewish historian Josephus. This is documented in Against Appion 1144. Philo lived in 40 BC to 40 AD and also says over 1 million Jews lived in Libya and Egypt during his lifetime. Strabo said, it's hard to find a place in a habitable world that has not admitted this tribe of men. Notice the key statement, the habitable world, right? Because we know that places in far Eastern Europe are not accounted for in the history of, of that region at that time, no one had any interaction with them. So that's pivotal to point out when he says the habitable world. Abraham Ibn Ezra wrote that Tafilat in Morocco was a great city of sages and Geonim. Morocco is in Africa. The term Geonim refers to a particular class of rabbis. You had rabbis in Africa, from North Africa to West Africa? You sure did. Traveling historians and ethnologists document the presence of black Jews in Africa. Eldad the Danite from 851 to 900 CD, uh, Benjamin of Toledo, Arab tra travelers, Tariq al-Fatash, al-Bakari, West Africa, 1067 CE, Leo Africanus, the Jews of Bilal al-Sudan. The documented presence of black Jews in West Africa and the Congo during the slave trade by Conrad Malt Brune. Two French travelers from the 18th century, Conrad and James, traveled around Africa during the time, this is important, of the slave trade and documented the tribes in Africa. While traveling through the kingdom of Luango, which is present day Congo, they came across black Jews. In their book, A System of Universal Geography or a Description of All Parts of the World, they wrote, the kingdom of Lugano contains black Jews scattered throughout the country. They are despised by the Negroes who do not even design to eat with them. They are occupied in trade and keep the Sabbath so strictly that they do not even converse on that day. They have a separate burying ground, very far from any habitation. The tombs are constructed with masonry and ornamented with Hebrew inscriptions. In a work known as The Life of Oludo Equiano, a kidnapped and enslaved prince, Oludo Equiano, stolen from Nigeria, belonging to the Igbo tribe of Nigeria. We know about his account. His account is that he was kidnapped and enslaved, taken from Igbo land in Nigeria and brought over through the transatlantic slave trade. His story is, his story is world renowned. And what's significant about his story is he is an eyewitness account an Israelite literally boarding the slave ships that came off the slave ship acknowledging that he's an Israelite. A letter sent by the elders and rabbis of the Ashkenazi community. Now, this is an important citation I'm about to go into. This is a letter known as the Letter to the Ten Lost Tribes by the Vilna Gaon. Some of you may remember or know of Harry Rosenberg. Harry Rosenberg is a descendant of a person renowned in the European uh, Jewish world. His name is the Vilna Gaon. His students sent a letter to the Ten Lost Tribes in Israel. And look at where they say the 10 lost tribes in Israel are, who dwell beyond the rivers of Nubia, Cush, that would be Africa, right, everybody? With the tribes of Dan, which Ethiopian Jews are considered to be, Naphtali, which are Ghanaian Jews are considered to be, Gad, which you find Igbo uh, Israelites are considered to be, as well as Asher and Isaskar. Now I'm gonna, Sonnet, I'm gonna need you to switch my screen over real quick because I just want to show that part on the big screen for everybody. So if you're there, Sonnet, please stop my time. Yeah, Thomas. To... Thank you, sir. I want to be able to show that on the big screen real quick. And while we're doing that, I'm going to hit you with this. You got five minutes left. Okay. I got you. Your screen is up. All right. Let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. Tom so this is the letter. Thank oh. Tom oh, so this is a letter uh, by the students of the Vilna Gaon to the ten lost tribes 
of Israel, which are in Africa, by the way, which you'll see everybody. Moses, which is a gift and inherited portion to our brothers, the children of Israel, the son of Iscot, the son of Abraham, who revealed the belief in Hashem. They are our holy and pure brothers, the righteous upon whom the world rests. B'nai Moshe, servants of Hashem, who dwell across the river Shevaton, also known as Sembation, and who plans an allegiance to the king, the king of Israel, who sits upon a mighty throne and who rules over the 10 tribes. Where are the 10 tribes? Whose settlement is in the land beyond the rivers of Nubia. Cush, who a camp according to their banners, the tribe of Dan, Naphtali, and Gad. So I just wanted to show that source. So I wanted to please stop my screen because I need to get back to my original PowerPoint. That's the last time I'll be doing that. You mean stop your time? I got it. <laughs> I, my, my apologies. My apologies. You got you, brother. Go ahead. Time stop. You got 417 left. Four minutes, 17 okay. seconds. As you can see, there's a continuation from Israelites who are coming off the slave ships what can sometimes be referred to as the holiness movement, and I think vocab is especially known to have these discussions, early groups in the Americas, North America to be exact, that speak about having um, a blood relationship to the biblical Israelites uh, of biblical times began with what's, what's called holiness movements, which were black churches all throughout America where their pastors, their leaders, their ministers spoke messages and 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 um <clears throat> and sermons relegating or excuse me identifying with being the israelites of the bible from this movement you get a rabbi known as chief rabbi arthur wentworth matthew he dates back to 1919 when he founded the commandment keepers here in harlem new york he was preceded by rabbi arnold jo uh, josiah ford who was the musical director of the UNIA, founded the Beit B'nai Abraham in 1923. He's an ordained rabbi, immigrated to Ethiopia. There's a, there's a lot that I can say, but because of time constraint, I'm going to move on. This is a map of black synagogues in Africa today. And I think that's important to point out. And uh, an I want to play this video. Son of this video can be played because I'm the owner of this content. Anybody that shares this content on social media, yeah. Sonetta, YouTube tells me, and I have the I have the um the right to flag their video, so I can play this video. I'm the owner yeah. of it. All right, yeah. just so yeah. you know. All right. Entity for themselves because they were slaves, or is there really something here? And the answer is most likely there is something there, and most likely maybe that they were the original Israelites, and maybe that the Jewish people today, who are white Caucasian people, um, came in. All right, just give me a second, Sonetta. That didn't play at the right spot, so just give me a second. You got to let me know to stop your time, brother. Yeah, that's why, that's why I was saying, wait a second. Same for you, Vocab. If there's any reason you need me to stop your time, you got to let me know. That didn't stop at the right place, so just give me a second. Okay. Okay. Another area right. in Africa where you zone. have uh, something big happening is in Nigeria. You have the Igbo people, or Igbo, pronounced either way. There's 40 million of them, also Christians, like I spoke about before, how that could happen to the children of Israel very easily. But also, a lot of them are now coming out and converting back or adopting the, the rules of the Torah without all the paganism that they've been practicing for hundreds of years. There's been books written about it from scholars in Nigeria, from scholars from the Jewish people. And where it gets interesting is in America, there was a slave trade. And a lot of the slaves, a very high percentage of them, came from Western Nigerian ports. And in America today, you see a, a very large movement of African Americans who say that they're the real chosen people, that they're the children of Israel, they're the Judeans. You know, so what are they just trying to create a, an identity for themselves because they were slaves, or is there really something here? And the answer is most likely there is something there, and most likely maybe that they were the original Israelites, and maybe that the Jewish people today, who are white Caucasian people, um, 
came in a little bit later on. We know that some of the greatest sages of the transmission of the Torah were converts from Rome. You have a man named Uncleus who, who wrote a commentary in the Torah, unprecedented, that we still learn today. He was a convert. Some of the, the largest pillars on the transmission today were Roman converts. So here we are, we're, you know, I'm speaking, we're ca Caucasian Jewish people. And now you have people in Africa saying that they're the real people of Israel. It can't be ruled out at all. We know they were sold into slavery. We know now that they're fulfilling prophecies by saying, we're coming back. We want to rejoin the nation. All right, I'm going to stop right there. And I'm going to say this as my closing remark. So I can, all right, I'm going to say this as my closing remark. Hopefully I got a little bit more time. Um, what I showed is that European Jews don't exist uh, before 740 CE. Uh, if we are to consider Greeks um, and Romans, uh, Jews or Israelites that come in there, that's a different scenario because they're not accounted as being what we call Ashkenazic Jewry. And again, Ashkenazic Jewry is said to make up at least 92 to 98 percent of world Jewry. Jews that live in places like France, Italy, Greece, North Africa, they're all considered Sephardic, not Ashkenazic. So I'm not the Israelite that says an Israelite has to be of a black skin and hue because a person could be genetically African and phenotypically European. So I have enough common sense to understand that. But I still want to get the story straight. All right. You can get it straight because we got... We up to the part where you cross examine each other and each of you have 10 minutes apiece to question each other. You have one minute to ask, to answer your question. Your one minute starts when the person finished answering the question. Um, Voltab, um, you go first in this round. You got 10 minutes and you will be cross-examining our brother Zion. You got 10 minutes. He got one minute to answer the question. Y'all got it? Yes. Clear as day. Is there any questions? I think, yeah, I think we got it all. Okay. Um, time will start when you're ready, vocab. Right. Zion Lex, in your book, The Star of David Controversy, you talk about the Masoretic scribes who precede the conversion of European Jewry. Well, the Masoretes flourished into the 10th century. That's in 900s. And yet you just said that there's this mass conversion of European Jewry in, this, in 740. Do you believe that the Masoretes were European converts? I'm trying to help. I'm trying to understand when you believe this mass conversion happened. All right, so if that's your question, I'll answer. Very easy question, a little silly, but I'll address it. So the term Masorite comes with the term Mesora, a Hebrew term. It's actually used in the Hebrew Bible, by the way. But vocab doesn't read nor speak Hebrew, so he wouldn't know that. Um, the Masorites are not a converted group. They're part of the rabbinical era. There are no European Jews during what's called the Gaonic period, which is where you have the beginning of the Masoretic scribes. But because he doesn't know that, because he doesn't study the history, he would ha not have a way to answer that. So the Masoretic scribes originate from what's called the Gaonic period, right? Which is from the fifth to the seventh centuries common era. You don't have European Jews before that time in history. So they're not a converted group. And by the way, the topic of the debate is who are the biblical Israelites today? Not Zion Lex. What did you say about your book, Star of David Controversy? It is relevant. I'm certainly going to quote your books. This is standard practice and debates, Zion Lex. It's relevant because it's relevant to some of the claims you've made tonight. And I'm going to do it again. In it was written and engraved. Towards the back here, you do Gematria with the name of the good ship Jesus, saying that it's numerically equivalent to 613. Zion Lex, are you aware that the name of the ship was not actually the good ship Jesus? It was the Jesus of Lubeck? I'm very aware of that. And not only am I aware of that, I wrote about this. So the term Jesus of Lubeck was still referred to as the good ship Jesus. So what's important here is that the ship of Lubeck came to be known as the good ship Jesus. But more importantly, what you're not pointing out, and thank you for um, pointing out my book, is that the term Yeshua Sefina, 
or the term Yeshua told Sefina the good ship Jesus has a numerical value of 613, which is ironic because the Torah states that the Israelites went into captivity because they did not to keep the commandments. But by the way, because we're having a historical conversation tonight and we're not talking about exegetical mysticism, I haven't talked about gematria. So once again, vocab is fishing for a way out because he fails to want to deal with history today, but I'll, I'll, I'll allow him to continue doing whatever he's trying to do. Yeah, if you're going to answer your questions like that, I'm going to answer my question similar because I'm just asking you to ask the question, uh, but you're doing a lot more than that. Hey, can, am I, can I be on the screen, Zion? Uh, uh, okay. I don't have what? control over who's on the screen. No, no, I, I'm saying with you is what I was trying to say. Okay, uh, you talked a lot about who are not the Jews. That was very important to you. Do you also deny that uh, most Mexican Americans are they Israelites? Since I haven't, I haven't studied that claim invasively. I do believe that there are studies that show that there's an Israelite presence uh, prior to uh, what's documented as the transatlantic slave trade. But I haven't studied that area extensively to speak towards that. Uh, I am not part of the groups that that accept some of those larger areas of of, of ideology. So, and I'm sure you, by the way, you know this. So I, yes. I'm, I'm guessing, I'm not finished answering, by the way. So I'm guessing what you're trying to do once again is fish for a way of trying to divide and conquer among the Israelite group for me to condemn their views publicly. So I'm just going to simply say that I haven't delved into those areas. Yeah, but again, well, I'm hoping do, that you, you should, to the you, should, you should probably do some research on that. And you yourself criticize One West groups. You yourself frequently tell them that they're caught up in juvenile matters, that they have, need to have deeper conversations, that they're immature. So this is something you do on your channel. So, you know, you're trying to win points with your audience by doing that. But this is something you yourself you do. You're highly critical of the groups, except in certain situations like now. But you don't agree with them, especially on things like Lashwan Kodash. So I don't know. Well, let's just be straight here. Now, you say that the transatlantic slave trade is encoded within the Torah. And you use Gematria to get that. Zion Lex, who was the first person that you're aware of that ever saw this code? All right. So just to be clear, I did not speak about any of that this evening. So once again, vocab does not wish to talk about the topic. The topic is who are the biblical Israelites today? Vocab has no historicity to enter the discussion. That's why he'd rather talk about things that are completely off topic. So I'm not going to buy into that because I stay on topic. So what I'm simply going to say is next question, sir. I'm going to okay. ask you questions that are on topic. Yeah, well, Zion Lex, let me explain to you. You can waste uh, your question, Ralph. Let, let me explain to you the way things work. It's, this is shocking that you don't understand this. Number one, it's common to read people's support that they give for their position in their works. I have done so. So you're pulling the, oh, well, I didn't talk about it tonight. That's somebody who doesn't want to defend their written work. Stand on your square. If you're willing to write it, you should be willing to talk about it and defend it, number one. Number two, Zion Lex, it's... It's part of your support for why you think you're an Israelite, which you have literally done nothing to show here tonight other than talk about why people aren't. So within that, you also write that your catchphrase is definitions bring us to a place of discernment. How do you define a biblical Israelite? A biblical Israelite is first and foremost one who was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. OK, how do you determine who is a biblical Israelite? by the methods through which I just showed you. You can even add methods such as DNA, which DNA is also present in the studies that ascertain the Israelite nature of Israelites throughout Africa, as well as Israelites in America. I actually did my DNA. I shared the results live on my YouTube channel, and my DNA shows markers all throughout the Middle East connected to Ethiopian Jewry as well. Hmm. You say now that Jesus is the Messiah, and this is important because this is the promise given to Israel. <laughs> this is the promise given to Israel, right? And you say you're a disciple of Messiah. So Moses said that you need to do whatever Jesus commanded you to do. So have you been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And if so, where? Okay, so that would be a great question to ask under a different topic. So I'm going to say next topic, sir. I do not have to answer any question during the debate, I will answer a question that is on topic to the debate. I'm an author of eight books on several different topics. If you're debating me on one topic, I'll address any topic. 
But if you're going to talk about several topics, you need to find another debate. But I'll tell the community what he's attempting to do. He understands expertly that there are several doctrines that divide and polarize the Israelite community. So if you notice, he's been fishing it with his question by pulling out doctrinal differences that polarize the community because he's desperate to have somebody on his side. But nobody wants to be with a loser. OK, Zion Lex. Uh the reason why this question makes sense to ask you is because you say you're a true Israelite. But if you haven't done what Messiah said, Zion Lex, you're not a true Israelite. So the fact that you can't see that, that you don't understand how it's relevant, really speaks to your lack of theological understanding. It doesn't pose a problem for my question. It poses a problem for your understanding, Zion Lex. You have not been baptized in the name of the Father, the Spirit. Otherwise, you would just answer directly. Otherwise, you would just answer it directly instead of being so evasive here tonight. And what it shows is that you're not a true disciple. That's the point. Zion Lex, are you 100% positive that you are a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Absolutely. My DNA connects to it. That's why I'm 100% positive. Okay. Do you have the DNA of Abraham by which to test this by? I do not need the DNA of Abraham. All I need is the DNA of the peoples who descend from Abraham and the surrounding regions. So that is my answer, sir. Well, that begs the question. You'd have to know who descends from Abraham, first of all. And, and that was the bulk of my demonstration to show that. So it's mainly based upon DNA that you know you're an Israelite? No, there are many other methods that I know that I'm an Israelite, that I ascertain what an Israelite is. As I said to you, even before this discussion began, we're forced to truncate information in this dialogue, even though we both recognize that because of the nature of the dialogue, it should be a larger uh, span to, in order to have this discussion. So there are many different methods. There's linguistics, there's cultural, by the way, I have all of those things ready. That's actually what I'm gonna point out to you when I start my questioning, because I have four more PowerPoints ready. Okay. Uh, Israel's been in numerous captivities, Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Greece, Roman, etc., And you would say transatlantic as well. During any of those previous captivities, did they forget their identity, who they were? Or is it just in the transatlantic slave trade that they forgot? Uh, in the previous Galut or the exiles that the Israelites have been through, it would have been impossible for them to have uh, forgotten their exile or, or their identity. During those exiles, they were always addressed as such as who they are. During all of those exiles, they were persecuted for following their uh, spiritual views and their religious system. So the question automatically is a nonsensical question, because if anyone is familiar with the Babylonian captivity, there are argues that ensue among the Babylonian captivity about Israelite practices, such as Daniel refusing to eat the king's meat because of his Israelite nature. When you go into the Persian captivity, there are also items where Israelites are arguing about following the gods of the Persians, such as Esther. So there was no, um, there was no room, as it were, or space for them to forget their identity because the captivities that they were in continually reminded them of their identity. So again, it's a nonsensical question, but okay. I so that, what I'm showing is your special pleading. So again, Zion Lex, I, I think that some basic understanding with laws of logic. By the way, sorry, it's not ten minutes yet. Would be helpful for you because what we have in this situation is I'm asking you that to so you can be consistent. Yeah. All right. Time is up, <laughs> I gave you a little run, but time is up, brother. Oh, man. You know what? I like this, man. I like this um, examination <laughs> round. And we're going to get right back to the uh, third round right after this. Zion, you have 10 minutes in your cross-examination. Vocab, you have one minute to answer the question. I like this shit. This is vocab came with some good questions too. I love it. Go ahead. Let's go, Zion. Okay, vocab. Uh, who are the historical Israelites today uh, based on history? The historical Israelites of the day. Um, they're mixed among the nations, but there's a small sort of physical remnant left within modern day Jewry. What is modern day Jewry? What do you mean? It's composed of, composed of multiple parts. You're focused and obsessed, it seems, with Ashkenazim, but of course you know that Sephardic exists. You did mention them. Of course, there's the Mizraim who stayed close by and never really left anywhere. In fact, there's continuity from these communities all the way back from Persian and Babylonian captivities. And so they're in the area that some people call the Middle East. I prefer South uh, Southwest Asia, I think is better to say. And so that's the groups I'm talking about. But of course... Titus 3.9 tells me not to be obsessed with genealogies. 
All right, great. So we're clear that he doesn't know, based on his answer, who are the biblical Israelites today. He ran around the question and then found himself back in the corner, and he says, well, they exist in small pockets among modern Jewry, a very vague and general term. So he doesn't know, but what I want everybody to be reminded of, when he's on these street corners battling Israelites, and many of them are newly come Israelites that don't really study as much, uh, he's going into a lot of history, but he's failed to do that tonight because I'm sure he understands who he's talking to. So my second question to you is this. Um, what historical sources have you looked at um, to consider there being uh, African um, Israelites? What historical sources have you looked at? A few things. One is uh, that was slick. You asked me who were the historical Israelites. And then at the end, when you summarized it just now, you said he said biblical Israelites. You didn't ask me about biblical Israelites. You asked me about historical Israelites. These are two different categories. Number number. Uh, in the Not the person who didn't address uh, the topic all night. Changing yeah, it. Well, you, you, you got to keep it consistent. <laughs> if you're talking historical, then keep it historical, not biblical. Uh, for example, I have Equiano's biography, for example, and he's a Calvinist Christian like me. He's not someone like you who rejected Jesus for most of his adult life and just now caught on. This is a good book. He doesn't identify the way you do because he knows what's important, and it's faith in Christ. That's first and foremost. I have some of the books you've mentioned, as well as a number of others, back on the shelf. I've talked about the fact that the Limba, Give the goods. Uh, well, specifically, the Buba clan within, especially the priestly class, male Limba, especially. And they match up with modern day Jewry. And that's why I said mixed among the nation and small genetic remnants. This is just a fact. And if you're going to do, do, do the DNA for one, for example, the Limba, then you've also got to say, well, some of the Ashkenazi. You're past 60 some seconds. Of the I know that for well. a fact. You got to have you're it all. All right, Tom, Tom. All right. So if you can, because I know I tried. Keep it to 60 seconds. We'd all appreciate that. I follow yeah. the rules. You should be able to follow the rules too. Um, my, th my third question to you is this. Um, in looking at what is considered today West African Jewry and the presence of Africans, um, excuse me, the presence of Jews in Africa versus the presence of Europe, I want to ask you a question. Can you contrast for uh, us the, the length of difference between the historical presence of Jews in Africa versus the historical presence of Jews in Europe and quantify for us who has a longer documented presence throughout Africa versus Europe. Jews have been in North Africa longer than Europe, but they've been in Europe longer than West Africa. It's not all the same. I imagine you know that. We don't get to conflate North African Jewry with West African Jewry. You pointed out in your map in relationship to this question you just asked, synagogues in West Africa. I thought that was really silly of you because we could do the same thing with Europe. We could do the same thing with Israel. And look, look at all these synagogues, Zion Lex. This proves they're the people. That was a silly move of you to point out synagogues in West Africa. The problem with the West African Jewry claim is that it doesn't have a paper trail. It simply doesn't have the paper trail that Jews always leave. They always leave buildings and books. And in West Africa, you don't have it. Okay, I'm satisfied with your answer because you didn't answer the question. So I'm going to move on to my next question. By the way, Sonata, how many more minutes do I have in the question? I you make sure you keep minutes, in time. 40 seconds. Five minutes and 40 five seconds. Five minutes and 40 seconds. Okay, so my next question to you is this. Um, you spoke of throughout tonight's discussion, uh, what is an Israelite from the lens of what the Bible teaches? Um, mm. I said that the title is Who Are the Biblical Israelites Today? is a historical title. And maybe you understood that differently, and, and that could be fine. So I want to pin you now to looking again at history, and I'm going to ask you this question. What historical sources have you looked at that validate or attempt to validate why it is that Ashkenazic Jews are not considered original Jews uh, versus them being converts? What historical sources have you looked at? Well, I've read all of the 13th tribe, so I've read things against this. I've read all of Sean Sand's book. It's so funny when Israelites like yourself bring up that book. It's like if you've read it, you realize Sean Sand doesn't even believe in the Bible. Sean Sand doesn't even think the Exodus happened. And then we got people that say they're faithful to the Scripture, holding it up. Like, look, if you've read the full Bible, you understand the position from which he argues from, and you can't hold what he does and be consistent. 13th tribe, he says that his research, which has been peer-reviewed and bel Lasted, but I'll tell you what he says. He says that his research only applies to Ashkenazim and his numbers are speculative. 
He doesn't even touch Sephardic and other groups. So these books that you guys trumpet out don't work. So what I've done is I've looked at the claims. And when people cite things that they got from Windsor, you know they're really off and really desperate then. Because some of these arguments I know originally derived from Windsor, such as a million and then it was 100,000 at a different point in your presentation. So all these sources don't prove what Israelites say they do. Time. Right on time. All right. All right. Thank you. So it's clear that you haven't looked at sources. Uh, you pulled out the 13th tribe. You spoke about reading all of Shalomo Sands books. By the way, you do have books in the background. So my next question is to ask you, can you show us those books and sources? Can you show us all of Shalomo Sands works? And can you also show us the 13th tribe? I believe you're at home, right? Can you yeah, show that? 13th tribe and, and Shalomo no, Sands books. No, oh, time out. I wanted you to be clear on what I'm asking you to do. Can you show us all of Shalomo Sands books that you said you read? And can you show us the 13th tribe? You said you read it. You're at home. I see books. Can you just show us? That's my question. Number one, I didn't say I read all of his books. I said I you read did. all of I said I read all of that book. You got to let him ask. All of that book. Well, I've read all of the 13th tribe, so I've read things against this. I've read all of Shomo Sand's book. It's so funny when Israelites like yourself bring up that book. It's like if you've read it, you realize Shlomo Sand doesn't even believe in the Bible. I don't know why you, I said I've read all of that book, not every single book that Shlomo Sand has ever written. I've read all of the invention of the Jewish people. That's what I said. I didn't say I've read every single book he wrote because everyone is not relevant. So I have read all of it, number one. Number two, uh, both of those I have digitally. Those are available digitally. Those are not physical books. The fact is I've read them unlike most Hebrew Israelites. So I don't know what that accomplishes, Zion Lex. Okay, so what it accomplishes is to show the people that like most people of your caliber, you don't care enough to actually read books. You go online and you look at PDFs and you copy and paste the part that you That's think a lie. is relative. You're lying I'm, on I'm, me. I'm, by the way, I'm talking. So please yeah, stop. No, I'm, 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 by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm no, you yeah, so Then I'm going to pull up the PDF. I'm going to pull it up the PDF. Matter. I, I, don't, I don't like time. you. You're lying. Time. Stop in the clock. Stop. It's going to change Number the nature of debate if you start lying on me, bro. Don't do that, brother. You're losing your cool. Yo, both of y'all, hold on. When Zion is talking on his time vocab, you can't talk. Vice versa. When vocab is talking, <laughs> Zion, you can't talk. You got to let him get his minute. Zion, um, vocab, you got to let him answer the question. Whether he's lying or whether he's not right, you got to let him answer without in, um, in, um, uninterrupted. And when it's time for you to answer, then you can bring that forth and let the people know he's lying. <laughs> Simple as that. And he can't cut you off. So that's how we're going to keep it clean. Um, people, some people does these tricks to knock you off your post. Not saying Zion do it, not saying you do it, vocab, but you still got to maintain the quorum. That's it. All right. Um, Zion, you got two right. minutes right. and 24 seconds left. It's on you, Zion. All right. Thank you very much. Now, bringing up the fact that a historian that talks about things that are historical doesn't believe in the Bible is completely irrelevant because we're talking about history. And as I mentioned, and I'm glad that he's proving my point, scholars of his caliber, the only thing that they do is they look at PDFs that verify and validate the part of the argument that they like and they believe fits their argument and they share that. Many of them do not read in full the works. But as I'm showing and can show on the screen clearly is that... um. Shalomo San writes The Invention of the Jewish People. That's the book that you were referring to that you said you read all of, but you can't show, even though behind you is a big bookshelf. He also wrote How I Stopped Being a Jew by Shalomo San. Let me see. Make sure everybody can see. All right. He also wrote How I Stopped Being a Jew. So what I'm showing, and I'm clearly showing, is that a person of this caliber, so I know if you could put back the screen on both of us, I appreciate that. All right. What I'm, what I'm showing is somebody of this caliber that is literally sitting in their home, surrounded by books, but telling you they have these books and they read these books, but when asked, can we see the books, they don't have the books. I'm just trying to show you that one of the reasons why people discredit and disannul the Hebrew doctrine is because they haven't studied it in full or invasively, right? Looking at PDFs and scourging online for the parts that agree with your narrative, that does not show scholarship. 
Real scholars actually are tangible with their material, which brings me to my second question for Vocab Alone once he stops sharing, uh, in my next question, once he stops sharing his screen. All right, let's go. How many minutes do I have left? You got 37 seconds left. Mm. I have 37 seconds to, to ask, and how many does he have the answer? Still 60? Yes, just one minute. Mm. Okay. All right, here's my last question. All right. So in looking at um, the expulsion of Jews from Spain and Portugal, what historical documents have you looked at that show that Jews went into Africa? And what historical documents did you look at to show that Jews went into Europe from the expulsion of Spain and Portugal? Well, we got royal decrees and whatnot from Ferdinand and Isabella to talk about this stuff. They got all excited about it. So there's primary sources in relationship to the expulsion from Spain. In relationship of flying, fleeing into uh, northern Africa, Josephus does say that's where some people went. Now, that's not the only place he says he went. As well as the guy you brought up, uh, the Danite earlier, he mentions that. But he also mentions Persia and Babylon and a number of places. He doesn't just mention the African continent. That's one thing about these debates I find very dishonest and disingenuous. Us. They'll mention only the African places, and it's usually, again, North Africa. You don't get to switch out automatically north with west. Uh, you, you have North Africa mentioned as if it covers all of Africa and then leaving out the other places they went. So there's a dishonesty there, and I think you've displayed that fundamental dishonesty tonight, as well as your complete ignorance that you think scholars only work with physical printed material. That is the silliest thing I've ever heard and shows you've never done post-grad studies in an academic arena. You're an EMT. You don't know what you're talking about. All right. Now, with that, I want to just say, first of all, both of you brothers are doing an excellent job. Let's not mess it up with the ad harms, with none of this. I'm not saying y'all doing that. Let's not mess this debate up. It's clean. The people loving it, and y'all both doing great. Now we go going to the third round. Ten minutes apiece. All right. So, vocab, you got 10 minutes in this round. Your screen is up. And time will start when you're ready. Uh, for this one, I'm not going to share the screen. I'm going to... Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I might bring that up later. We'll see. Gotcha. But here we go. All right. I want to cover a few... Huh? Remember, when you hear this, yeah. you got five minutes left. And the next time you hear it, your time is up. All, All right. right. Okay. Time will start when you're ready. Okay. Um, are we ready? Yes. Okay. I'm going to stop. I want to cover a few things that were made during tonight's debate. Haven't got to cover yet. And uh, one of them was interesting. The Zion Lux brought up the holiness movement. And he brought out how some people during that time started saying, hey, we're the real Jews. He is indeed right. And he is right. I'm known for having these conversations. And what I've been able to show through primary sources written by the first folks who they called themselves this, black Jews at the time, was that the very first time you have anyone claiming that they received this revelation was in 1889, Reverend William Christian. And I have his first book, 1896, is when the first book from a Hebrew Israelite perspective was published. And there's a few things that are interesting about that. One is both Christian and though and the one who followed him shortly after. After Crowdy said they received it by vision, by some kind of secret revelation. It wasn't from studying scripture. And in fact, the argument for Deuteronomy 28 that you'll hear Zion Lex make, he hasn't made it tonight. In fact, Zion Lex has not quoted the Bible once the entire time that I can remember in a debate that is titled, Who are the Biblical Israelites? Because he knows the Bible doesn't support his position. Now, how is a Bible teacher not going to quote the Bible? Leave that for you to decide. It wasn't until 1925 that you have the very first use of the Deuteronomy 28 argument, meaning in the beginning of the movement, it wasn't even based upon that. That wasn't even an argument. You have that in William Cook's book uh, that he wrote in 1925. So this is fascinating. You never have an explicit claim prior to that. I brought up earlier that. It was a silly move that he talked about. Look at all these synagogues in West Africa. Number one, it'd be interesting to know how far those go back. That'd be something very interesting because I know for a fact the rise in the increase of synagogues being constructed in West Africa is tied to a post-colonial West Africa, without exception, almost, meaning the, ins the ins current uh, surge is based upon missionaries saying, maybe you're the lost tribes, maybe you're the lost tribes. Tudor Parfit has done excellent work on this, and a lot of Israelites just can't deal with what he says. He brings up Harry Rosenberg. That was That's funny to me, as if, well, an Ashkenazi man says it, so therefore it's 
true. I don't operate that way. He's not my authority. He's playing Harry Rosenberg videos. I'm quoting to you from actual Jews in the first century. Paul, John, Jesus, whose bona fides are established, unlike Zion Lex. Harry Rosenberg, by the way, still thinks he's a Jew. So how are we get? Are we discounting that? Which one is it? So there's lots of problems here. He says well, vocab live when he he said about the European Jews. No, I wasn't referring to what he said. It was one of his last quotes he brought out about someone saying, I haven't heard of the European Jew until the 10th century. And not only that, yes, he mentioned a few cities on my slides and verbally I mentioned way more cities. That was the point of that. And it's interesting. He talks about people going to North, North Africa, but notice he leaves out Persia, he leaves out Babylon, and indeed, Eldad the Danite, if his account is to be trusted, he thought that Issachar dwelt near Media in Persia. That's not Africa. He thought that Zebulon went from the Armenia to the Euphrates River. Where's Armenia at, ladies and gentlemen? I'll let you pull out the map and see. He thought that Ephraim and Manasseh were in South Arabia, and Simeon was in the lands of Babylon. That means most of the tribes, according to your source that you brought out, if you trust him, weren't in Africa by your own source. Why don't you bring that out, Zion Lex? You're saying I haven't read it. Then how do I know these things? Because I have, just like the Equiano book, just like the Hebrewisms book. So that's why I don't appreciate slander on your part. I, th I feel like you're better than that, but I guess I was wrong because I don't think you've ever had an academic debate. You talk about academic debates. And this is something that's clear. It's something that's obvious by the way you move. He says, I'm gonna bring out real sources and proceeds to pull out Codex Juda Judaica, <laughs> leaving the Bible entirely out of the discussion, which is just shocking to me. The whole time, his presentation was who the Jews are not. What evidence did Zion Lex give that he is a descendant to any of the people he mentioned? What evidence did he give? He didn't give any solid evidence, and he certainly didn't give biblical evidence. We're at the point now where Zion Lex, in a debate on who the biblical Israelites of today, ladies and gentlemen, is citing the U.S. Department of Defense— <laughs> That's where we're at, ladies and gentlemen. The DOD over GOB, my goodness, focused on the Khazars. And then he talks about conversions of the Khazars. Well, there's a problem there with his Masoretes and the Khazars because the Khazarian conversion is earlier, yet he's holding the Masoretes are authentic Jews. There's a problem with his chronology about who he wants to hold on to as a true Jew versus a convert. But let's just say all the Ashkenazi are converts. Okay, let's just say that's true. Zion Lex knew Old Testament law, that wouldn't even be a problem because that is something that can actually happen under Old Testament law. It doesn't really make a difference or matter if you're going by Old Testament law. But I'm not looking to Moses as my authority. I'm looking to the one that Moses prophesied and said, listen to everything that he says. He talked about the 13th tribe. Again, I do not understand the limited mindset that thinks unless you have a physical book, you don't understand it. It's one of the silliest things I've ever heard and just shows he doesn't really travel in circles outside of an echo chamber. If you look at the people that he says are his teachers, you'll notice they're all people who are within a certain realm, a certain sphere of belief. He lives in an echo chamber. So he's the biggest fish in a small pond, but he doesn't really know how to do these things and how it operates. The 13th tribe has been peer reviewed and shown to be fallacious, but I didn't just go on a peer reviews, I read it and saw his numbers are speculative. If Zionlex has read the book, she will see where Kessler makes the leap in his numbers and then says, there's no way I can say it's all Ashkenazim and the, the, my theory would only apply to that Ashkenazim. And it essentially leaves out genetics as being part of the conversation because that wasn't really on the plate for the most part for him. And in regards to Shlomo Sand, rewind it, you'll see I said I read all of his book, not all of his books. I know of the other book, but it's not as irrelevant. It's not as relevant because Shlomo San is a progressive liberal Jew who doesn't believe the Bible. He is not an authority to me, and I don't know why he should be authority to Zion Lex because all of his presuppositions are anti-biblical when you actually read the book. He doesn't have a supernatural understanding of Israel's history. He has a naturalistic understanding of it, which indeed is a misunderstanding, which seems like something we would agree on. But Zion Lex is so desperate, he's turning to secular white Jews, basically, to try to prove his point. That's a real shame. Don't you think, ladies and gentlemen? Now, as far as how many Jews actually fled into North Africa, the sources don't always agree on that. And notice he didn't actually 
read, I think, from what we would need to read from. I need to see it directly, not just, oh, he said this. Because sometimes what happens is you'll get one of these historians who will say this amount of Jews were killed in Jerusalem, and that becomes that's how many fled or things like that. So there's a lot of problems with his methodology here. And most of all, we saw that in how he interprets Scripture. Although he didn't really put much out there because he didn't spend that much time interpreting Scripture in a debate, I remind you again, that is, who are the biblical Israelites of the day? Now, I'm going to temporarily share my screen. If you could temporarily share it there, please, Zion Lex. I'm sorry, Sonetta. I'm looking at Zion Lex saying that. Sonetta, do you, you hear me? Okay. So here's what we looked at. We looked at uh, these things, and I'm going to re reiterate what I showed here tonight from Scripture. He did not contend a single point. All he did is says, those guys building tunnels aren't the real Jews. Okay, I'm not arguing for that, so it's totally irrelevant, Zionlex. Your obsession with Ashkenazi is not shared by me, and so what you needed to do tonight and utterly failed is go against my biblical lines of ev evidence because, again, the debate is who are the biblical Israelites. The thesis statement, through Messiah, the church is true Israel now and for all eternity. Look back at the debate and tell me one time Zion Lex found anything in his bag to show that that was incorrect. Not a one. Not a one. Woody Allen not being a true Jew doesn't negate this statement, Zion Lex. And I think you know it. You're playing to the audience in a way that is unbecoming of a man who says he's a scholar. Biblical line of evidence one, God called Abraham to bless all the families of the earth. Is that true or is that false? He knows it's true. He never dealt with it. Number two, being counted to true Israel was never based on mere or sheer biology. He never even stepped against that. He never even had anything to say against it. Not even one time. Regardless of who you like, regardless of who you root for, ask yourself, did he touch any of these? And ask yourself, is the title of the debate biblical? Israelites or biological Israelites? It's biblical. Third, the Messiah is the ultimate fulfillment of promises to Abraham. It took Zion Lex 25 years to realize that. He shouldn't even be teaching in the way he's teaching with these grandiose statements. Honestly, Zion Lex should be sitting down under a pastor who knows that Jesus was Messiah because Zion Lex, according to Christian discipleship, you are a novice. And the fact that it took you that long for Jesus to be recognized properly by you, a man who says he knew scripture for a decade and a half, shows you had some major blind spots. Why not admit that and take the position of humility? I'm not saying be taught by me, be taught by the New Testament. Biblical line of evidence for the believer in Messiah now shares the Abrahamic promises. In every single way, when you have something applied to Israel, it is now applied to the church. <laughs> Therefore, the followers of Christ are the true biblical Israelites. All right, man. We are at the end of Vocab's round, and we are at the beginning of Zion Lex's third and final round. Come on in, Zion. The time will start when you start. And family, ready, sir. I want everybody to get y'all questions ready, and then y'all will have a two-minute closeout. All right, Brother Zion, you going to put okay. up a screen or what? Uh, I'm going to put up a screen in a couple of moments, so I'm going to need you to, to watch what we're doing, because when I need the screen to get put up, I'm going to ask you to. You might want to just have it ready. Go ahead, like, yeah, like, it's ready. It's ready. Uh -oh. All right, so oh, I, oh, you know what? I see what you're saying. Let me yeah, put it. You know in the, I mean? Let me put the in the back. Put right. it in the holster right now for you. Right. That's what I'm talking about. Of <laughs> and when I ask you to share that, please do. Got you. All right. All yep. right. Thank you very much. All right, Tom. We'll all start. right. So, all right. I'm ready. So, as I've made mention from the beginning of the debate, vocab showed up for the wrong debate. The debate is who are the biblical Israelites today. That is a historical question. That is not a question to examine or reassess. The Bible's views. Again, I am a biblical practitioner. I believe in the Bible, but I also believe that when we're talking about history, that we have to go into the historical record apart from what the Bible is saying so that anybody with intelligence knows that there's a space for belief, but there's a space for history. And if you truly believe the Bible is history, then you should be able to align it with history. I'm not doing anything wrong, sir, by bringing history. But by the way, you have not brought a single historical data to confirm anything on topic today. Instead, you decided that you want to give a sermon on the mount to people who typically don't want to hear you or, or what you have to say. So you were preaching to a choir, but not this choir. 
But let me go on to, to, to say a couple of things really, really quick, because you said some things that were really crazy. You said um, Zion showed a source for Eldad the Danite that said that the Israelites were in West Africa and they went and, and they were considered parts of the tribes of Dan and parts of the tribes of Gad. And he says, but in this right here, it says, by the way, when y'all look back at the video and y'all know, y'all know me, I'm going to play that back this week. When y'all look back at the video, you're going to literally see that he's holding up a notebook because he has no source. He's also not giving you a page number in any book, be it a PDF. And I dare him when we get back into the question and answer round to give us the page number for the book and the book name that showed you what Eldad was saying about where those people went. Because we literally saw you hold up a notebook. That's when I started to laugh because I already know what you're full of. But I just want to make sure the people saw it. So we're going to move on. And, I, and I'm going to also show some things. Let me get into some um, cultural things really quick. Um, Sonetta, can you share the screen now? Okay. So Vocab Malone says that um, the sources in the uh, the book, The 13th Tribe, that talked about the Khazar conversions, they're in question, and, and there's no real scholars that support that, right? So I knew he would make that mistake. So I had this ready. This is from the Jewish Encyclopedia, by the way. I'll even take um, the link, but Sarnetta, remember Sarnetta, yeah. You don't got me on. I'll put it on Zion Lex University. All right. I can't do it here. But this is from the Jewish Encyclopedia on the Khazars. And I'll highlight that so that everybody can see. Now we're going to get to this part where it says succession of kings. This account of the conversion was considered to be a legendary nature. Notice the word was, was considered because it's no longer considered to be legend. We now know that the Khazar conversion, Ashkenazic European conversion is factual. I'll go on. Mind you, this is in the Jewish encyclopedia. Harkavi, however, proved that from Arabic and Slavonian sources that the religious disputation at the Khazarian court is a historical fact. So Vocab Malone said um, that Zion Lex, when he showed the picture, he didn't contrast the Egyptians. That was a silly mistake. But anyway, let's, let's keep going. This book right here goes into some of the cultural elements in West Africa. Uh, we're going to talk about dress for a moment. The book is called The Black History Book, and page 149 begins to talk about kente cloth and its origin. I'm going to fast forward some of this because of time, but I want to point out something. Alice C. Lindsay, a biblical anthropologist and African historian, in a work known as the Nilo-Saharan Aran Nubian context of Abraham's ancestors, she has this to say about kente cloth. The origin of the words Cain, Kenan, Kenan, Kenite is originally Nilotic. That means descending from the Nile River, adjacent to, surrounded by. And the name is found among extant African tribes. Related are the words kente, cloth worn by the Akan, kenten, the cloth basket, Kenya, the country, and the Kenem, the Kenembu, and the Kentum tribes of Nigeria, and the Kanakuru, who live in Adam Awa and Boono, the land of Noah. There are many other peoples in West Central Africa with names related to Canaan. She's talking about the linguistic connection between the term kente cloth as represented also in the Bible for the Hebrew term. In the Bible, we're introduced to Joseph who wears a coat of many colors. The coat of many colors that Joseph wears is called in Hebrew a ketonet, which Alice points out in her work that the word ketonet is actually the origin of the term kente, which she views as a corruption of the term. As we continue, the coat is said to be a coat of many colors. In 2 Samuel, King David's daughter Tamar also wears a coat, a ketonet of many colors. This is the Hebrew term right here. And she posits in her work that kente may be a corruption of the Hebrew word 
ketonet, ketonet. And as you can see, this is the original. I don't know why he did this. This is the original. When you guys go back to Vocab Malone's presentation, you're going to laugh because Vocab Malone showed you an artistic rendition first before he showed you the primary because the artistic rendition showed the Semites being much lighter in color. Now, when you look at the primary, you can literally see that the Semites look very much like the Egyptians, although some of them are a bit lighter in hue, but still would not be ca classified or characterized today as being a Caucasian people, a European people, or even a white people. They would still be considered a people of color. So he's all the way wrong. This is a close-up on the primary, also showing that they are people of color. But for the sake of cultural attire, I want the close-up here. Because you can literally see this interwoven garment, similar to what you see in West Africa, worn by early Semites in the Levant. And it is draped on their shoulders in the same way that you see kente cloth worn throughout West Africa. Through many linguistic studies and through many uh, geographical studies, Many tribes in West Africa posit that they have an origin in Canaan land. For instance, it is a known fact among historians that the Fulani oral tradition of them originating from Canaan land is a historical fact. So when people from the Levant or Canaan land venture to other parts of the world, like many people, what they will take with them is their culture, maybe even their cultural attire and their cultural dress. So if you look literally, at the cultural attire of women in Ghana wearing the kente cloth and the style and way in which they wear it, you can literally see it is exactly the same as it was worn by Semites in the Levant. And here is a picture contrasting the two. Not only is it worn in the same exact way, but even the interwoven pattern and style if I went into the intricacies of it, you would notice that the royal Hyksos ruler that is wearing this type of garment, the way in which it is uh, worn is quite different than the people who are with him. And that's because in Ghanaian, Nigerian, and in West African culture where kente cloth is worn, there is a distinguishing color and style pattern of the king or the ruler among them. So when you look at the Hyksos king, you'll notice that the style and pattern of his is quite different than the people that travel with him. The same that you see it in West Africa. It is always distinguished. The kente cloth that the ruler wears is always distinguished from that of the neighboring people that are with them. Um, in Sheikh Anti Geob's book, Civilization or Barbarism, on page 58, him and both Chancellor Williams connect that the Hyksos are related to the ancient Hebrews. This is spoken by Sheikh Antigio in Civilization or Barbarism on page 58. And this is spoken by Chancellor Williams in his Destruction of Black Civilization. Senator, you can stop my share screen. I just want to talk now for a moment. And I want to say something really, really quick. Um, there were people that were critiquing in the chat room that Zion didn't show any African scholars. And I want to make something clear for a moment. I didn't need to show African scholars on this topic because the dagger of this topic was to show that the European Jews were heavily sourced in showing how Africans and Israelites leaving the Levant, coming into North Africa and further migrating into West Africa and forming Israelite communities all throughout West Africa. What vocab wants, Malone wants to do is ahistorical. He wants to act like none of the migrations into North Africa made their way into West or South and Central Africa, even though we know for a fact there are communities of Jews in Central, West, and South Africa today who all say that they migrated into this region from North Africa and is acknowledged and documented by historians alike. But vocab alone would like to keep them in North Africa where the lighter, brighter people are because that would fit his argument. Me showing Jewish sources primarily tonight that show that the 10 lost tribes went into Africa was one of the biggest daggers of the night. Because in Jewish sources, they show that the majority of Jews did not flee to Europe 
which is currently posited by some in academia, but they actually fled into Africa. Then the letter written by the Vilna Gaon shows that there was a huge chunk of Israelites in West Africa that they considered to be the 10 lost tribes of Israel. So again, what vocab doesn't know or understand is when you're having a historical conversation that in part is based on the Bible, sure, the Bible is the premise for which we're having the dialogue, but if you can't show it in history, then you haven't showed up for a historical conversation. And just to be clear, when the question is, who are the biblical Israelites today? That is a historical question. So I say congratulations to Vocab Malone for showing up, but not showing out. Brother Zion, both of y'all, Vocab, y'all have done a great debate. We're going to ask you now, Vocab, to close out. All right. I appreciate uh, the topic being asked. It's an important question. Going in, I knew a few things might happen the way they did. Number one is that we'll be essentially answering two different questions because I had a feeling, even though it said biblical Israelites of today, that it wouldn't essentially be read that way. It would be read along the lines of who are the historical Israelites and am I related to them? That's a sort of how Zion Lex approached the issue. I don't really think that was the question today. And there was a lot of unfortunate things. The debate could have been more academic than it was. Essentially what I was doing is showing big picture theology, meaning reading large swaths of scripture and show how they fit together within a larger narrative of what's happening in scripture. And that's an important thing for the believer in the Bible to be able to do, especially as it relates to promise and fulfillment. So number of times what I did is I pointed to the initial promise, which creates hope and expectation. And then after the promise is given, you see historical patterns that God sets up on purpose divinely. This is historical co correspondence that gets created. And that's why you see types and anti-types. And my hope, because I did read uh, Zion Lex's books, that he would understand that. Because at one point he mentioned David as an archetype. And I said, if he is able to grasp that hermeneutical concept, then we could have a fruitful discussion. I was disappointed, and I think I was wrong in my estimation of that. I hope that that changes in the future because I think it could be a more profitable discussion if he's able to grow in that area instead of relying on parlor tricks, which is partially what he did here tonight. And I think he's above that, but I don't think he's ready to, to grow out of it yet because this could be much better. Nonetheless, I think it was still a good discussion, which I'd like to have something like this again, if possible. But this is important to understand. We got to start with Adam. And when we start with Adam, we see God's desire to be amongst his people. God walked in the garden. And then that gets imitated or replicated with the Exodus tabernacle among the Israelites, as Abraham is sort of a new Adam called out from the mass of Adam's descendants. This is made even greater with the Old Testament temple amongst the Israelites. And then clearly in verse after verse after verse, Christ replaces the temple as the place where God's presence especially dwells and the place where forgiveness and atonement happens. Jesus literally says, I am greater than the temple. And when I say Jesus, I can say Yeshua. I think since we all speak English, we should understand I'm using an English translation of a Greek word. That's all that is. We know the historical biblical person I'm talking about, or at least we should. Then you see it continue on with the church as the new temple, being described as the house of God, as living stones, as a place where God's presence dwells, as each individual believer. Then you see the final city temple in Hebrews 8 and 9 described, the city that Abraham himself was looking for, and Revelation 21, when God dwells with his people. This is the nature of the argument I made here tonight, which starts all the way back in Genesis and flows all the way to Revelation. It's a thoroughly biblical argument and is God's ultimate intention. When a person is interpreting scripture in an old covenant way, they're in the wrong time frame because the Messiah has come. Unfortunately, it mainly wasn't that because there wasn't much engagement with the text. I myself know no other way to answer the question, who are the biblical Israelites without using the Bible? And last thing I want to say is, if you are in Messiah, then you are seen as being a true descendant of Abraham. And I implore the audience to be a Messiah tonight. Thank you.